Amen. There's one thing that the redeemed, born-again soul loves to do is to just bask in who he is. And just to, just to sit down for a second and just, and just think about his glorious perfections and to just be overcome by the beauty and the glory and the astonishing majesty that he has. And just sit and not ask him for anything, but just to see a little bit deeper and a little bit more of that glory. Don't, don't let my eyes go shut. Just let me keep seeing who you are. I mean, how many of you... How many of you can say, I know what it means for him to be a way maker. I've, I've, been, I've been in some dark places, and I've been stuck, and I've been involved in some stuff that I didn't think there was any hope left for me. And I didn't know how I was going to come out of that. And here you are this morning, and you're not where you were, and he's brought you so far, and you're out of that stuff. I mean, how many of you know what it's like to have a way-making God? And you can just sit back and say, God, I know where I was 10 years ago, 5 years ago, earlier this year. I know what I was, and I know I'm not that now, and I can't take credit for that. I didn't do anything to be different. I just am different, and that's you. And just sit back and just love him and worship him and pour your heart out to him because that's who he is. That's what the born-again heart loves. It just loves God for who he is, and that's enough. And that's all I'll need forever is just who you are. Just worship the Lord for who he is today. We just take a moment and pray with me. Father, we just love you so much. So many times in our prayers, we don't say it enough. We don't say it enough to each other, and we don't say it enough to you. We just love you for who you are. We just love you for all of your glory, all of your supremacy, all of your majesty, all of your beauty. Our English language is rich, but it's not anywhere near rich enough to describe you. You outstrip our deepest concepts and our loftiest ideas and our richest and most intricate symbols and pictures and parables and stories, and we, we're, we're groping along a dark wall trying to find any way to capture who you are. And we're just groping in the dark because you, you're so much greater. You're so much more holy, powerful, and wonderful than we can describe. And we thank you for that. We thank you for just who you are. And as we continue to worship you this morning... I pray that you would keep our hearts open before you and fill our hearts with love and faith and joy just to be in your presence and just to hear your word, to just delight in the fact that we get to hear your word and to know that it's a word that's powerful enough to bring the universe into being and it's a word that's powerful enough to change my heart and change my life and to break my love affair with sin, and to turn me into that new creature I'm supposed to be. Would you help us just to glory in your word and celebrate who you are as we listen to the word preached? And may it be a true act of worship. May I worship you as I speak. May your word go forth. May I decrease and you increase. And may we all worship you as we listen to the word preached with eagerness to know what you want us to know, to believe what you want us to believe, and to do what you want us to do, and to know that that is the path of greatest joy. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I invite you to take your Bibles and turn with me for our Scripture reading for our sermon this morning. We are going to be in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 15, as we continue our series in... Our, our series on reformed, or on biblical reformed worship. Starting in the middle of August, we've been talking about biblical reformed worship. And so far, we've been dwelling on that biblical piece with a little bit of the reformed piece, and we're going to continue building our case forward for how the Bible tells us, or how God tells us through the Bible, how He wants us to worship Him. Now, one, one note of correction is that as I was finishing up this sermon Friday afternoon, 
I was preparing two sermons. We had a funeral here yesterday, so as I was in between writing two sermons back and forth, I got to the end of this one, and I thought, you know what? I'm going to go a different direction. <laughs> Lord doesn't often do that to me. I hope it was the Lord anyways. I hope it wasn't just me sabotaging myself. But I got to the end, and I thought, no, I'm going to go a different direction. And so... I didn't re rewrite, rewrite the whole thing, but I had to change some stuff. But one of those changes is the title. So in your handout and in the bulletin, the title uh, is The Elements of Worship. I think, Lord willing, that's going to be the title of next week's sermon because there was no way I could get to that in this sermon. So the title of this sermon is just The Regulative Principle. And you can, you know, if you want to, you can mark that out in your bulletin or in your handout and change the title. But this should be the title for next week. Well, let's get to our scripture reading. Matthew chapter 15, we're going to read together verses 1 through 9. I ask you if you'll please stand with me for the reading of Holy Scripture. Matthew 15, 1 through 9, this is God's holy word for us, his people. Then Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem and said, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat. He answered them, And why do you break the commandment of God? For the sake of your tradition. For God commanded, Honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, If anyone tells his father or his mother, What you would have gained from me is given to God. He need not honor his father. For the sake of your tradition, you have made void the word of God. You hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. This is God's holy word for us, his people. Let's ask him to bless our time in it. Lord, please sanctify the reading of your word, and now especially the preaching. Write your truth upon our hearts, and change us this morning to be more in alignment with your truth and in your word. For the glory of your name, we ask it. Amen. You may be seated. At the end of last week's sermon, I raised, but did not answer, the question of fixed worship versus free worship. Worship is fixed if it is completely settled or determined. Fixed worship must be followed exactly, no exceptions. You just open the book, you see what it says, you don't think, you just read and do. It's fixed. And there's nothing else to discuss or think about. Worship is free if it leaves some things open, undetermined, and allows some flexibility. Free worship requires thought and wisdom in how it is formulated and conducted. So let me give you an example. Uh, in traditions such as uh, Anglican denominations, Episcopalian, Roman Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, Lutheran, there are, there's very fixed worship. Let's take the Anglican, for example. They have what's called the Book of Common Prayer. You may have heard of this. And when you want to do a worship service according to the Book of Common Prayer, you don't have to think about it. You just open to the correct page, and all the rubrics are there, and exactly what the minister is supposed to say, it's already written down. And then what you're supposed to respond, it's written down. And then all the prayers are written down, and all the motions and movements, the kneeling, the sta it's all set. It's fixed. There's no thinking. There's just, just read and do. The only thing that isn't fixed is the homily or sermon portion. And that's up to the minister to say what he wants to say in his sermon. Unless you're in the Church of England and you have what's called the Book of Homilies. And you can, the minister, if he wants to, can pick one of those homilies and he can just read. It's a whole sermon, start to finish, word for word, and just read it. So that in some cases, if the minister decides to do it this way, you could have even the sermon could be fixed. 
and he would just read it, and it's already written. It was written in the 1500s, and, and you just read it. And that would be very fixed worship. Or you can go to a place where you don't have, um, you don't have everything written down, but you have general guidance. Whenever you do this, here's a model for how you could do it, but it's up to you to adapt it to what you want to do. You could have guidance. So it's a little bit fixed, but then there's a lot of freedom and flexibility as well. And the, uh, the Puritans had a book like this. It's called the Westminster Directory of Public Worship. And it's a manual with guidance, but it doesn't say you have to do it this way. It leaves a lot of freedom. Or you could go to other churches that have, it's utterly free, we come in, we sit, and when the Spirit moves us, somebody will do something. <laughs> That's the freest worship you could have. Fixed versus free. And there's a spectrum. It could be very fixed, very free, a little fixed, a little free, and any combination of the two. So this is what we're asking about the regulative principle. How fixed or how free should worship be in the regulative principle of worship that we've been discussing? Here's the key thing to remember about this principle. Whether it's all fixed or all free or any combination of the two, both fixed worship and free worship must be under the control of the Scriptures. This is the regulative principle. That all worship, whether it's fixed or free, all worship must be according to Scripture. That's what we looked at last week. God gets to tell us how to worship Him, and He has done so sufficiently in the Bible. The question we must face this morning is, how specific is the Bible about what we should do in worship? Does the Bible tell me I'm allowed to take off my coat because it's so hot? That's my tie. Does the Bible tell me it's okay to do that? <laughs> I don't know, but I just did it. And ruin my tie in the process. Fair enough. How free or fixed is worship? What does the Bible have to say? God has fixed all our worship. Ex has God fixed all of our worship expressly, explicitly, and exactly? Or has, or has He left some things more or less free? This will determine how strict the regulative principle is and how it should be applied. That's the issue we have to face this morning. Now, I hinted last week that Paul seems to assume that some matters are free in worship. Let's recall what I said last week. Paul says to a church he's never visited before in Colossians 3.17, whatever you do in word or deed... Do everything, in the, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Just that language of whatever you do, whatever you do, it seems to suggest to me that Paul does not know for sure exactly what the Colossians do in worship. Whatever you're doing over there in worship, make sure you're doing it this specific way. Whatever you're doing over there, do it in this specific way. i got to take this off. It's very distracting. It's distracting you. It's distracting me. There we go. So when Paul says this in Colossians 3.17, whatever you do in worship, in word or deed, do it all in the name of Christ and for, for God, giving thanks to Him, this seems to suggest that for Paul, there's some measure of freedom that's permitted in Scripture by the apostles in our public worship. Now in our passage this morning in Matthew 15, the teaching of Jesus about traditions and commandments and how they relate together in worship will serve as the starting point for developing a fully biblical approach to the regulative principle. So here's what we're going to do this morning. I've got three things I want us to do. First, we will examine Jesus' teaching 
in Matthew 15 as the basis for approaching the regulative principle. Number two, second, we will construct a model out of what Jesus says. We will construct a model to employ in analyzing the regulative principle in detail. And then finally, we will use that detailed model to begin applying the regulative principle in terms of what we should do in worship. Now, we can only make a start, and we will get into the specifics, Lord willing, in the next couple of weeks. But I'm trying to build Bible underneath what I'm saying. Instead of just saying, uh, guys, here's what we're going to do in worship now because I'm the pastor and get over it. I want to put Bible underneath it so that we can all see it for ourselves. Yes, our worship is biblical, not just reformed, but biblical. That's where we're going. We're building a model for how to use this principle in worship. So let's begin. Let's begin by walking through the passage and see what Jesus is doing here. As the passage begins, Matthew 15... Jesus is confronted by the Pharisees and the scribes about a disputed matter of Jewish law observance. Look at verses 1 and 2. Then Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem and said, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat. Very interesting. Jesus and his disciples, whenever they are about to have a meal, they don't do this ritual of purifying the hands. And there's a whole book in Jewish tradition. It's, it's a book called the Mishnah. It was compiled about 200 A.D., so roughly two centuries after this, but it's based on much, much, much earlier material. And in the Mishnah, you can see the regulations that the Jews are commanded to follow as part of their oral law that, didn't get, that was oral at this time, wasn't written down yet, got written down later. And you can see the specifics about how you're supposed to wash the hands before you eat. It's not about cleanliness in the sense of germs. They had no concept of germs. It was about ritual purity, having clean hands, as you partake, as you thank God for food and eat it. It was about ritual purity. And it's called here the tradition of the elders. It's not in the, it's not in the Bible. There's no, you'll, you can go through the whole Old Testament law and you won't find any command that says you have to wash the hands before you eat. That's why it's a tradition of the elders. And Jesus and his disciples don't follow it. And this is a problem for the Pharisees and the scribes. And they call him out on it and they rebuke him. Hey, Jesus, how come you and your disciples don't follow this tradition? That's the context. Jesus responds with an argument that basically says, uh, yeah, you're one to talk. Look what you do. Look at verse 3. It says, he answered them, and why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? In other words, you're telling me that I violate the tradition of the elders? Hey, you guys use the tradition of the elders to violate God's word. So, why are you calling me out? Look at yourselves. Which is worse? Me not keeping your traditions that you made up? Or are you using your made-up traditions to contradict Scripture? That's Jesus' reply. Jesus says, you are clearly in the wrong. It's not wrong for me to break your tradition, but it is wrong for you to use that tradition to break God's commandments. And then Jesus gives an example. He doesn't just throw out the accusation. He actually gives an example. Look at verses 4 to 6. For God commanded, honor your father and your mother. That's obviously one of the Ten Commandments. That's Number five, honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. Another passage from the Old Testament law. That's what God's Word says, but you say, verse 5, you say, if anyone tells his father or his mother, what you would have gained from me is given to God, he need not honor his father. So for the sake of your tradition, you have made void the Word of God. What's going on here? Well, that, that language there of given to God, 
given to God. That comes from a Hebrew word that's translated offering all over Leviticus, all over the Old Testament law, especially in Leviticus. And it's the, it's the word korban. And it's, this passage is referred to as the korban rule. That same book I mentioned, the Mishnah, that talks about the laws of washing the hands before eating, it also talks about this, the korban rule. And in other words, this, this rule, the Pharisees and scribes are using this rule, which says when you make a vow, and you make a vow pledging to give property or money to God by dedicating it to the temple, now it's sacred and holy, and you can't take it back. You can't renege on that vow. It's korban. It's given to God. It's out of my hands. I can't. It'd be like you giving, writing a big check to charity and then saying, oh, actually, can I get that check back? Yeah, it's, you don't do it. It's taboo. Well, this was the rule. They said children who don't want the burden of caring for their elderly parents can take that money they were supposed to give to support their parents in their old age, and they can say it's Corban. Oh, I've already dedicated this to God. So I'm out of the obligation to take care of you, mom and dad. And the Pharisees and the scribes supported that rule. He says, so you have taken this Corban rule, and you've found a loophole to get out of the responsibility of caring for your parents by saying it's given to God? Now here's the thing, it can be pledged to be given to God, which means I can still keep it in my possession and use it, and it's pledged to be donated at a later date. I mean, what, I mean, what a sneaky way to get around having to take care of your aging parents. Kids who didn't want the responsibility to honor your father and mother, especially in their old age, and they found this loophole, the Corban rule. It was never what God intended for the rule. I mean, this is filth. This is disgusting, right? And Jesus calls them on it. He says at the end of verse 6, So for the sake of your tradition, this Corban ruling, you have made void the word of God. You have taken honor your father and mother and made it of no effect. It's null and void. Amazing. Amazing you Pharisees. And you're going to call me out for not washing my hands? Ha! By, and now, he seals the deal. Jesus seals the deal now with an accusation of his own and a passage from Isaiah 29, 13. Matthew here quotes, in, quotes it in the Greek version. So if you go back to the Old Testament in your English Bible, it's translated from Hebrew. And it won't read exactly the same because Matthew here is quoting from the Greek translation of the Old Testament for his Greek-speaking readers of his gospel. But the passage is from Isaiah 29, 13, and it seals the deal. Verses 7 to 9. You hypocrites! Well did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. By this quotation from Isaiah, Jesus just made this whole dispute in verses 1 to 9 about worship. It's not just about hand washing. It's not just about the fifth commandment or the Corban rule. This is about worship, Jesus says, by quoting this passage from Isaiah. In Isaiah, that passage is being used to rebuke the ancient Israelites for how unacceptably they've been worshiping God. And now Jesus takes that, a passage about how God rejected their worship, and he applies it to these scribes and Pharisees in this dispute. All of a sudden, this whole thing is about worship now for Jesus. He says, by doing these things, you worship me in vain, you hypocrites. It's hypocritical worship. The scribes and Pharisees worship God hypocritically with open lips but distant hearts. And they intrude into God's word the commandments of men. Excuse me, they intrude into God's worship the commandments of men.
In other words, their worship is neither in spirit nor in truth. As we saw from John 24, Jesus is, excuse me, John 4, Jesus is teaching on true worship. Therefore, their worship is in vain. You see, we worship in spirit when our hearts draw near to God as we open our mouths to honor Him. And we worship in truth when we follow God's commandments rather than man's. When we follow word worship rather than will worship, as we saw last week. This is Jesus' approach to the regulative principle. This is what point one is, approaching the regulative principle. How should we approach this principle for how we should worship? We should use Jesus' approach. Jesus is approaching worship as a regulative principle approach. It emerges straight from the surface of Matthew 15. Worship has to be according to God's commands, not our traditions that somehow violate or make void or contradict His, His Word. This is regulative principle worship, and it's Jesus' approach. And the fact that this is a clear articulation of the regulative principle is why our confession of faith, the Westminster Confession of Faith, cites it as a proof of the doctrine. But this is just an approach. This is just the surface level approach. What we need to do now in point two, as we go on to analyze the regulative principle, is this. We need to go deeper into this text if we want to develop a robust model for how to analyze the regulative principle. Jesus mentions several items in this passage, and he ranks them by authority and priority. Authority and priority. There's two groups of items he mentions here. On the one hand, he mentions the tradition of the elders. He mentions your traditions. Twice he says your traditions. And once he says commandments of men. So that's one group. Tradition of the elders, your tradition, commandments of men. They are what Jesus criticizes. On the other hand, we have this other list of items Jesus names. He names the commandment of God. He mentions the word of God. And he mentions doctrine in verse 9. Commandments of God, Word of God, and doctrine. So we got these two collections of items in this passage. And Jesus takes these two items and he puts them together and he ranks them by their authority and their priority. And he tells us how we should relate commandments and traditions in our worship. From this, we're going to build a model for how we should approach the relative principle. So I want to make three observations about these two items, these two groups of items that Jesus names. Traditions from us, commandments from God in God's Word. Three observations, and from these observations we, have, we build three categories for our model. Then we'll take that model and we'll apply it in point three. So it's clear where we're going. Three observations, building three categories, and that's our model for how we should apply the regulative principle. So let's look at these one at a time. Observation number one. Jesus ranks God's Word and commandments above the commandments and traditions of men. And he rebukes the Pharisees and scribes for giving priority to their own traditions. So we must teach as doctrines only what God commands in His Word. And you see this here, teaching as doctrines in verse 9. He says, you are teaching as doctrines man's commandments, man's precepts. And so here, commandments of men are opposed to those doctrines, which tells us that we should be teaching as doctrines, not man's commandments, but God's commandments. Doctrines on the other side of man's commandments. Don't teach as doctrines man's commandments. Teach as doctrines God's commandments. In other words, we cannot command anything that God has not commanded. 
That's observation number one. We don't get to command, to demand with divine sanction something God hasn't explicitly commanded. We don't get to make up God's commandments. We simply receive them. These are divine doctrines, divine teachings. Jesus says God is the one who makes the commandments, not us. So we shouldn't teach anything as though it were God's command when it isn't. We cannot command anything God has not commanded. That's observation number one. And that's category number one, commands. Divine doctrines, commandments. Observation number two. Jesus, in this passage, does not condemn all traditions. He does not condemn all traditions. What he condemns is man-made traditions that either contradict Scripture or compete with Scripture. Notice what he says in verses 3 and 6. He says in verse 3, Why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? What's the problem? The fact that you have traditions? No. The problem is that you're using your tradition to break God's commandments. That's the problem. You're, when your traditions contradict commands, when they contradict Scripture, then there's a problem. Or as he says in verse 6, For the sake of your tradition you have made void the Word of God. You've made void the Word of God. And he says in verse, in verse 2, these, elder, these um, Pharisees and scribes, he says, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? In other words, verse 9, Why are you violating these traditions that we command? Why are you sinning? by not washing your hands before you eat. You see, what they've done is they've used these traditions to contradict Scripture, and they've put these traditions on the same par as Scripture. And this is still what happens in Orthodox Judaism today, is that their oral law, the oral law, is something that was revealed to Moses alongside the written law. And the written law is the first five books, right? Genesis to Deuteronomy, the Torah, the written Torah, and they believed that Moses was also given an oral law, an unwritten Torah that's outside of, alongside of, that helps you interpret the written Torah, and that both of these are divinely revealed to Moses on Mount Sinai, and the written Torah is preserved as scribes make copies, but the oral Torah is preserved as one generation of rabbis and teachers and scholars and sages and prophets teaches the next generation. And it's passed down orally until around the year 200 it gets written down in the Mishnah. And the Mishnah later goes into the Jewish Talmud. So this is still something that Judaism has today. And so what they're saying is, our tradition of hand washing doesn't need to be in the Bible. It just needs to be part of this oral law. It's from God too. It's on par with the Bible. Our tradition is on par with the Bible because we didn't make it up. We got it from Moses. And Jesus rejects this. He says, I don't care if you think that God himself whispered this in your ear. If it's not written down, it's not most authoritative. Which means all tradition has to be in submission to the Word of God. No matter what the tradition is, no matter how old it is, venerable it is, no matter how many brilliant saints and sages have believed it and preached it, it doesn't matter. Tradition doesn't come from the mouth of God like it does in Scripture, so it can't have as much authority. The Bible has to have supreme authority. The Bible judges our traditions, not the other way around. That's Jesus' problem. Your tradition is okay as long as it's not contradicting what God says in the book. Or as long as it's not competing with the book. This is what we call in Protestantism sola scriptura. That the Bible alone, Scripture alone is our ultimate final authority. And not any traditions, not even traditions we think are divine and come from God. Only Scripture is that. So here's the category. The hand-washing tradition was fine. Even though it's not commanded in Scripture, 
so long as it wasn't enforced or imposed on all Jews as though it were commanded by God. So the Pharisees and scribes can say, look, if you're going to join our team, if you're going to be in our movement, here's some of the traditions we follow. Our team washes its hands ritually, ceremonially, before we eat a meal. Now, you don't have to join our team. You can go over there and join the Sadducees or the Herodians, or you could be a Hellenizer, or you could join the Therapeutae, or join the Fourth Philosophy, or be an Essene. Or, I mean, there's a hundred of these groups in first century, second temple Judaism. There isn't just one Judaism that everybody followed. So the Sadducees have their rules, and this group has their rules. That's fine. But if you join our team, you have to follow our rules. That would have been perfectly fine. Perfectly fine. Jesus' disciples don't wash their hands. The Pharisees do. Fine. But the second you start saying, oh, you don't follow our rules, you're sinning against God and you're breaking God's commands. Now Jesus has a problem with you. <laughs> You've elevated tradition to the level of a divine commandment. Don't do that, he says. Especially don't develop traditions that are not consistent with the Bible. So local customs that are binding on the people in that group is fine as long as you don't turn them into universal commandments. So that's the second category. The first category is commands that come from God. The second category is customs, which are our traditions. And those customs are locally binding, but they have to follow Scripture. They can't contradict it, and they can't compete with it. Customs. Commandments and customs. Now the third, the third element. Third observation, third category. There is an enormous freedom to practice what we talked about earlier, the Korban rule. To practice the laws of, offer, of free offerings and vows, the Korban rule, is a biblical rule. The Bible talks about Korban. It's a biblical, divinely revealed thing. But it's not required for everybody to make a vow, to dedicate their property, to give this offering. It's a free will offering. It just, the Leviticus 27 has just the whole chapter is about how to practice korban. If you're going to dedicate this patch of real estate, here's how you do it. If you're going to dedicate this animal, here's how you do it. If you're going to give this selection of your produce from your field, here's how you do it. Once you give it, you have to do this. And once it's given, you can't take it back. And, and there's all these rules for how to do the Korban offerings, but there's no rule that says, and all of you must do it, must do a Korban offering. You're free not to. So, it all, the rules in Leviticus 27 just govern the circumstances for how you administer this rule and how you follow it. And the circumstances are various and free, and there's no fixed way that you have to do it. It just gives these broad limitations, and within those limits, within the fence, you can go anywhere you want. You can do it however you want. So these people were free to practice the Korban rule in a whole host of different circumstances in Leviticus 27, as long as you don't manipulate the Korban rule in a way that contradicts or violates Scripture. Korban is a biblical rule, but it's flexible enough to allow great amounts of freedom in how it was practiced. Kind of like in the Garden of Eden. Right? The, the, Adam and Eve are told, don't eat from this specific tree, but all the other ones have at it. Go nuts, go wild, eat, eat, of, eat out of every tree you want, just leave this one alone. There was enormous freedom. Practice Korban, do your thing, that's fine. But don't violate Scripture in the way you do it. Just don't contradict Scripture. If it's consistent with Scripture, you are free to practice this rule how you like. So that's the last category. We got commands, we've got customs, and we've got circumstances. Commands, customs, circumstances. We've got these three categories that emerge from the passage in the way Jesus treats these two groups of items, God's commands and our traditions. And these categories go from the most fixed to the most free. Commandments are totally fixed. Customs are somewhat fixed but have some flexibility, some freedom, and then circumstances are the most free, the least fixed. Commandments, customs, and circumstances. These three categories 
that arise from Jesus' teaching in our passage form the model for approaching the regulative principle. This is our model. And we built it piece by piece out of what Jesus himself says in Matthew 15. Now, final point today. Now that we have this model in place, let's use it. Let's use it to apply the regulative, the regulative principle to Lord's Day worship. Remember the, the three categories of this model. Commandments, customs, circumstances. Commandments come from God. Customs and circumstances are our tradition. Going from most fixed to most free and from most important to least important. The regulative principle can be broken down into three similar categories. First is the elements of worship. The elements of worship. The elements refers to the central actions we should do in a worship service. The elements, the specific actions and pieces that need to be in a worship service that God commands us to have in a worship service. Whatever Scripture commands and only what Scripture commands can be an element of worship. This is what's fixed. Let me give you an example. Prayer. The Bible commands us to pray when we gather to worship. So if we gather to worship and we forget to pray, we've, we violated a commandment. A commandment that says, when you worship, you need to pray. So that's an act of worship, offering prayer. That needs to be there. Second category, we got elements. The second is forms. This corresponds to customs, forms of, of these elements. The form is the manner in which an element is observed, and it's the mode by which the element is observed. The manner and the mode. Let me explain. Manner and mode. Let's keep prayer as our example. A mode of prayer is a kind of prayer. What kind of prayer should you offer? Well, there's lots of different prayers. You could have a prayer of thanksgiving. You could have a prayer of praise and adoration to God. You could have a prayer of supplication, where you ask God to supply your needs. Supplication. You could have a prayer of intercession, where you pray for God to meet someone else's needs. You intercede on their behalf before God. You could have prayers of confession and repentance. Prayers that ask for forgiveness. And there's all kinds of modes of prayer, kinds of prayer. But then once you've picked your kind of prayer, now you have to ask, what ma in what manner should I offer it? In other words, should it be fixed or free? Should I write the whole prayer down first and then read it? Or should I just not think about it at all and then just get up here and just let it go? extemporaneous prayer or should I like have bullet points and what I'm gonna say about those bullet points who knows I'll I'll discover what I'm gonna say as I'm saying it but I'm gonna make sure I say it about these three things you see what I'm saying there's freedom or there's fixed free or fixed that's the manner of prayer what kind of prayer are you gonna offer and then is it gonna be every word is gonna be fixed or are you gonna just sort of let the Lord lead you as you pray. These are questions we need to decide. What, God wants us to pray. Okay, how? What kind of prayers and in what manner should we offer them? That's the form of an element. That's the form of an element. Now the third category is circumstances. This is the same as in the model. Elements, forms, and now circumstances. Now we get down to all those nitty-gritty questions of details of order and arrangement and the equipment we use and the environment. Like, okay, we're going to pray. We know we have to pray. We've picked our form of prayer. Now we have to decide, at what point in the service should I offer that prayer? Do I offer at the beginning? Do I offer 18 prayers? Do I offer two prayers? Six, five, four, three? Who should pray? Where should the person stand? Which direction should they face? Is it okay to use the microphone when you offer the prayer? I mean, we have to decide a million little details, right? Those are just the circumstances. And of course, those are going to be very free. The Bible's going to have the most to say about the elements and the least to say about the circumstances. So there's this spectrum. Some things are very fixed by the Bible. 
uh, the elements are explicitly fixed. The forms are much less fixed. There's a lot of freedom, but the Bible does have a lot to say about it. But then circumstances, I mean, those are going to be different depending on you know, which side of town you're in. So this is the regulative principle. Elements, forms, and circumstances. Our task is to make sure that all of the elements are implemented exactly as God commands. They are fixed. The forms allow for some freedom since they're not entirely fixed. And the circumstances vary widely from church to church and across space and time and culture. Elements align with commandments, but forms and circumstances align with our traditions. Remember, the Bible does not condemn all traditions. It just says they have to be consistent with Scripture and under the authority of Scripture. So all of our traditions, our elements, our forms, our circumstances, all of it needs to be under the authority of the Bible and under the control of the Scriptures. And we'll talk about how we do that in the next couple of weeks, Lord willing. Let me close this way. Let's conclude this way. In the matter of elements and forms and circumstances, the regulative principle insists that all three categories must be under the control of the Scriptures. The elements are directly commanded, but forms and circumstances also need to be biblical. Just because they're free, that means they, they, they don't have to be biblical. The question is, how do we make them biblical? Free worship is not the same as will worship. This requires, as we said last week, great wisdom. Our minds need to be under the control of these scriptures so that when we formulate our traditions, our forms and circumstances, they're biblical. They're biblical through and through. The final point I want to leave you with is this. Although we're building this model of regulative principle worship out of what Jesus says in Matthew 15, don't miss Jesus' bottom line point that he's making to the scribes and Pharisees, and to you and me. His bottom line point in our passage this morning is this. Do not worship God in vain. Worship Him in spirit, with a heart that draws near to Him, and in truth, with a mind that's fixed on God's Word. Worship Him according to His truth with your whole heart. Make sure, Christian, whatever we do in worship and whatever you do when you come in this place, that your own heart and mind is under the control of the Scriptures. That your heart is not just honoring Him with your lips, but your heart's far from Him. Don't offer hypocritical worship. Make sure you're worshiping Him in spirit and in truth. Bring a ready heart that seeks to meet with God. And bring a mind that comes to just see and know and drink in His truth. Worship Him in spirit and in truth. That's true worship. That's the kind of worship the Father wants. That's the kind of worship the Father is seeking. True biblical worship in spirit and in truth. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for Christ, for the fact that he didn't just he didn't just come to be born and then jump straight to the cross, but he lived a life where he opened his mouth and he taught us these things with clarity and boldness and precision and power. Thank you that these things have been recorded and kept for us in your holy and inspired scriptures. And I pray that each of us, my heart and my mind, and that everyone else here, that their heart and their mind, that all of us together would have unity of heart and unity of mind, seeking to worship you in spirit and in truth. Help us to be a church that is absolutely sold out 100% to making our worship as biblical as possible, for making our thinking as biblical as possible, and for having a heart full of flaming, hot faith that loves you has zeal for your worship, loves you for who you are, and wants to draw near to you and not offer hypocritical worship. Help us to come into this place week after week, and we need your Spirit. We, in our flesh, we can do nothing. But with your Spirit in us, moving us, molding us, carrying us along, changing us from the inside out, we know that you are molding us into the worshipers that you want us to be. 
Keep us, we pray, and help us as a church to worship you truly and with all our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.